And so, ladies and gentlemen, now we have left the best for last. For this panel, we are going to be exploring innovations to safeguard the future. Please join me in welcoming to the stage to tell us more, Sara Al Khouri, scientific researcher at Khalifa University, Hazam Awad, research associate at Cambridge University, Salim Nabil Abu Bakr, Abdul CEO of Agrican, Salma Yunus, PhD student at Qatar University, and your moderator, the fabulous Leanne Abushkayer, editor and researcher at Forbes Middle East. Please put your hands together for our speakers. Hello, hello everyone. I hope you've been enjoying the summit so far. Um, we're actually concluding with a panel that is really, really interesting. We have uh, some of the most or some of the smartest people in the region with us here who are doing an actual work um, and have an actual impact when it comes to sustainability and science. Um, uh, they, I know they all look very young, but trust me, with their work, is amazing. Uh, I would like to start by Sara. Sara, if you could tell us about what ha what motivated you to actually um, join this industry and do the work that you are doing. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for having us here uh, on this uh, amazing uh, event. Um, so uh, going back to your question, I always ask myself the same question, why did I do, uh, for example, scientific research? And the first thing that comes into my mind is actually a person. When I always remember the person, uh, and allow me to mention his name, he is Dr. Saif al -Mihiri. Uh He was a national faculty at Mazdar Institute back in time where we first met. It was in, I believe, 2017. And whenever I see that person, I see the way he was explaining science to me, the way uh, he uh, shows me or explains science, that was very motivating me. And to me, he was like a spark that ignited this passion of scientific research. And since then, I continued in the field of uh, research and I did my master's and my uh, PhD in Khalifa University uh, under the supervision of Professor Kiryaki Polikronopoul, uh, which, I, which I always say she continued what Dr. Saif has started in, uh, in, in reinforcing in me, which is this passion for scientific research. That's really interesting. And can you tell us, you know, your work is mainly focused on advancing sustainability in the UAE. So can you tell us about the challenges that you have faced when trying to do um, this mission and how are you actually able to overcome them? Okay, I think um, for every new, every, uh, every unique or innovative technology or solution that you are trying to implement, uh, there are definitely challenges that you have to overcome. And from my perspective and from my experience through scientific research, uh, I can kind of classify them or define them over two scales. I would say the first one is the fundamental research scale. Um, so in, in, uh, as you mentioned, I am working on developing materials, catalytic materials, uh, to transform vegetable-based bio-oils into biofuels. This area itself is, in the region, a new. So uh, imagine that at Khalifa University, we have a lab that is designed to develop these type of materials, but now these materials have to work for a, a project that is completely new. So I would say the first and the foremost challenge that I have to face in this area is is the lack or the access of uh, advanced infrastructure that helps me to characterize my materials properly and design them very well for these type of projects. So for this thing, I had to uh, make my explorations across the world and travel for different countries and make uh, collaborations and try to you know, utilize the different techniques that are available abroad 
uh, for uh, that could help me uh, to develop these new materials for this field. That's really great. And uh, now if you allow me to move to Hazem. Hazem, uh, we met uh, um, like a few weeks back during the under 30 photo shoot. And then when I asked him, uh, what are you actually doing? Like explain to me in one sentence, what are you doing? So he said that I'm trying to reduce emissions around the world, which is one of the main challenges that we face environmentally. So Hazem, can you tell us how are you trying to you know, tackle such a big challenge that you know, us globally facing? Thank you. Thank you for having me. Salam alaikum, first of all. Uh, it's a great honor to be here uh, in Forbes 30 under 30. So how, how the question is how I reduce emissions, right? Yeah. So there, there are two ways to reduce emissions. You can either change the way you burn stuff, okay? And stuff, I mean the fuel and the oxygen, or you use uh, clean fuels, or to be more specific, relatively clean fuels. Uh, we worked on something called uh, trying to change the way we burn. So we worked on something called uh, flameless combustion. In that kind of, of combustion or the way of combustion, we are trying to change the conventional shape of the flame with a very high temperature localized in a region into a more distributed flame. And by doing that technology, we can actually achieve a very low emissions. And the technology at the moment is a proven technology, and it's been used in uh, different sectors. However, when it comes uh, to uh, aircraft engines, for example, it's a bit uh, challenging. The other way we can reduce emissions is to use a relatively clean fuels. So in, in we work in, in Cambridge, at the Energy Group at Cambridge. Uh, we collaborate with uh, 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 aircraft air manufacturers, Rolls-Royce, to design their hydrogen-fueled uh, aircrafts. What we do is that we try to find the most optimum design in terms of emissions performance, and take that design and install it in the hydrogen-fueled aircraft. The project is very interesting, challenging, and inshallah expected to result in uh, the first commercial hydrogen aircrafts by the year 2035, and net zero carbon emissions from the aviation sector by the year 2050. That's really interesting. And you mentioned the hydrogen, and hydrogen um, is considered as the fuel of the future. And you mentioned that it's a bit challenging when it comes to you know, using it or implementing it. Can you explain to us further um, the challenges that, you know, that come with it, trying to use uh, hydrogen, and how can they actually be mitigated? Yeah, it's a great question. So hydrogen. Hydrogen can result in zero emissions only if it was burned with pure oxygen. But the thing is, we're burning hydrogen with atmospheric air, right? So we have nitrogen as well. And that leads to the formation of nitrous oxides, one of the most naziest emissions ever that can cause uh, health issues for the human being and environmental problems. And let me tell you something about hydrogen. When hydrogen burns, it burns with a very high temperature more than uh, any other fuels. And that's the most convenient and perfect environment for the formation of these emissions. So what we do is that, that to mitigate that, we try to optimize the, uh, uh, the design of the, of the aircraft engines, for example, uh, try to optimize, find the most uh, suitable conditions of burning in order to find the most optimum design that can be installed, for example, on a hydrogen-fueled aircraft. So we, we do uh, loads of simulations, loads of simulations, and at the end of the day, we pick a handful of best uh, designs ever. And, that, and then we do extensive analysis on these, and we pick the, the best, uh, the chosen one, in terms of uh, reducing the emissions. Thank you so much for sharing these insights with, with us and for explaining this topic that might be a bit difficult for some of us to actually um, understand. You've made it very simple to us. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I would like to move to Salem. Salem, you work in the agri-tech industry. 
which is pretty much new to the world and to the region specifically, um, we can see a lot of startups and companies actually trying to, to work and, and to do well, um, some work in the agri-tech industry. So can you tell us, if we want to focus uh, on the Middle East, how are you, you know, able to successfully build an agri-tech company? Okay, uh, first of all, thank you for having me here uh, to represent AgriCan. AgriCan is working on agriculture robotics. We manufacture a full solution in Egypt for precision spraying. We manufacture robots like the tractor that can detect the disease and then make precision spraying depending on the percentage of the disease itself. So we, when we focus on the persona of the farmer, the farmer it shows the planet for, uh, for the field and then can hire the farmers to help them, and then can go through a long process for the farming uh, practices. Also, we, uh, also, when we focus on the farmer persona, we can find him, agriculture engineer, to detect the disease. Uh, and the, actually, the farmers in Egypt and the Middle East are making everything in the land. So to convince the farmer, the farmers know the financial model for farming 100%. If you ask a farmer about the price of the crops, he follow up every day the price of the crops like the, like, uh, the, the, like the forex, exactly. So the thing that I think it will be optimum for the farming that you can make awareness campaigns, you, can, uh, you should go to the farm itself and make the agritech solution live on the farm itself to see the difference between uh, the agri-tech and traditional agriculture. That's, uh, that's great. And, you know, uh, food security is um, a global issue. Um, everyone is scared when we, th when we think about it. Um, and can you tell us, so how can agri-tech companies actually get um, scaled to a point where you're not only supporting food security locally, but you're actually supporting it globally? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, actually, nowadays in AgriCan, we are going into a consortium. So I believe in the consortium can create uh, a more efficient food security, especially when you make a partnership with another company. For, for example, we are nowadays enrolling in one of the consortiums with a company in Lebanon called Luxid. It can make uh, uh, robots for uh, laser weeding. And another company in Spain, it can make satellite imaging and another one in Italy, it can manufacture harvesting robots. So we make a full consortium. Each startup of the, of the country can share the knowledge. Uh, so I think sharing the knowledge is one of the keys of the success in the food security, especially uh, when we speak in agriculture uh, field here. That's, uh, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing um, all of these insights with us. I'd like to move to Selma. Selma, you are doing, um, you know, you are a female in the science industry, uh, which could come with its own challenges and expectations. So can you tell us how have you managed societal expectations and what advice do you have to offer to others who are actually trying to shine in this industry? Sure, so Salaamu Alaikum everyone. So as a woman in science, I feel that women almost always face a lack of recognition, especially when it comes to leadership positions in science. When I first started uh, my career, I would go into the lab and it's full of women doing the experiments and all, but when you actually go and see who is the supervisor, they're all men. All the PIs, all the people getting the funds and guiding the projects, it's men. Now, um, in the beginning, this, this was a bit um, not disappointing, but it made me feel like I started listening to others who are saying, maybe you're in the wrong place, maybe uh, this is not meant for women, etc. But then um, I started just trusting my vision and trusting what I want and my inner instinct. And this is my advice to everyone. Uh, just trust your inner instinct and always follow your dreams. And uh, especially um, younger women who want to pursue science, I've seen already in the last uh, few years, I'm happy to see that like Forbes and the events, they are shedding light on women in science and it's very inspiring. So we're starting to see uh, uh, young women very successful with moving from uh, lab work into entrepreneurship and being leaders in science, this is already a very positive thing. 
Absolutely. And, um, you know, um, turning uh, research into a market-ready innovation is not easy. So can you tell us about the challenges that scientists face when they are trying to do this and how, they, how can they actually overcome them? Sure. So moving from lab work to business, to the market, um, is very difficult. And we call it in science as the uh, value of death. So it's basically like a gap between science, lab work, and industry. And um, the reason why it exists is, uh, I believe that it's mainly because we as scientists, we are driven by discovery and we are, we are very good at science. But if you speak to me about something related to business, I would, it would be very overwhelming to me. I don't know much. I had to learn this through meeting new people, networking with the right people. This is something I learned and I developed throughout my career. But most of us scientists lack this kind of uh, experience. So I think this is why many of the reasons uh, it's, most of the lab work stays in the lab and it doesn't move forward, is that we don't know how to or which track to, to go through. And if you look at numbers, in fact, like it's, it's very striking. It's 0.1% of all therapeutics that are being made in the lab. Only 0.1% of them move forward towards human trials. So the rest remain in the lab, remain for publications, etc. They don't move forward. And from those 0.1% who move towards human trials and are being tested on humans, 95% of them stay at that stage and don't even get market towards the market. And this is why, uh, this is because of this gap. So we need more networking, more collaborations. We need to like, stay open-minded and learn from the business people and try to speak their own language so that we move forward. You know what you mentioned, and your last point is very interesting, because actually, since this is the last panel of the day, and the first panel of the day, we opened it with, uh, with Amal Dukhan, who is a VC investor. She mentioned that uh, working with scientists is sometimes very difficult because it's so hard to actually uh, as you mentioned, turn science into business or turn it into the market. So actually, that's a very interesting way to bring us to, you know, to the closing of how we, it's like it's a full circle now. Um, so thank you so much for sharing this with us. And thank you so much for my four panelists who are actually trying to, you know, um, raise uh, the, the science industry and trying to do an actual impact around the world. Thank you so much for being with us. Hello, hello. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you so much, Leanne, and our speakers for a fantastic session. And that wraps it up for day one of the Forbes Middle East 30 Under 30 Summit in Abu Dhabi. So excited to have it here in the nation's capital for the very first time. And we are going to be bringing it back again tomorrow. So we're going to see you here from midday. Be here from midday to make sure that you do not miss out on any of the action. And of course, in the evening, we have our awards ceremony. So much more to come, and we cannot wait to see you tomorrow. Have a wonderful evening, everybody, and good night.